In this video, I'm hoping to demystify the logarithmic function by making connections to a function you already know, the exponential function. I'm hoping if you're watching this video, you have an idea of what an inverse function is. If not, I'll link a brief introduction to this video so you can catch up. If you're up to speed on finding inverse functions, you know that to find the inverse of a given function, we simply switch the x's and the y's and then solve for y. So for an exponential function, like y equals b to the power of x, switching x and y would result in x equals b to the y. We also know that the inverse of a function is a reflection over the line y equals x compared to the original function. If this red function represents my exponential function y equals b to the x, then this green function represents its inverse, x equals b to the y. Now, as I mentioned, with inverse functions, we like to solve for y because we're accustomed to writing functions in that way. Think about y equals x squared, y equals sine of x, y equals the absolute value of x. So we've missed a crucial step in finding the inverse of this exponential function, which is solving for y. Usually it's just a matter of bringing some terms over to the other side to solve for y. But in this case, how do we do that? And it's a fair question. How do we isolate y if y is in the exponent? Now this is where logarithms come in. So to answer the question, what is a logarithm? Well, simply put, a logarithmic function is just the inverse function of an exponential function. Logarithms are just so applicable to real life that they get their own name. So let's go back to the question of how do I solve for y? How do I turn x equals b to the y into y equals something? I like to think of this y exponent as an apple in a tree. The only way to get that apple down is to cut down the tree and turn it into a log. Or, you know, get a step ladder and minimize your ecological footprint. But that's not a very good memory aid, is it? So in order to solve for y, I'm going to take the log of both sides. Remember, my exponent is the apple, and I want to cut down the tree to make a log. So when we end up taking the log of both sides, we end up with a pretty intimidating expression. Another principle of inverse functions is that if you sub in the original function into the inverse, you get x. Remember, an inverse function is just a reflection of the original function over the line y equals x. So if we go back to our complex expression, you should see here that what I actually have is the original function, b to the y, substituted into the inverse, log of base b. f inverse and f are essentially going to undo each other, leaving me with x, or in this case, because it's my argument, y. So there it is, the logarithmic function. We know that if the original function was y equals b to the x, then the inverse function would be x equals b to the y, also known as y equals log, base b of x. One quick note about bases. The most common logarithm, referred to as the common logarithmic function, is written like this, with no base. Ah. It's commonly accepted that this is a logarithm of base 10, so instead of writing log base 10 of x, we just write log of x. So now that you understand what a logarithm is, what, e what even a logarithm is, I, I don't know, you're able to start looking at some of the key features of the function. Now we're going to look at the common logarithmic function. Remember, the common logarithmic function is just the inverse of 10 to the power of x, because there's an implied base of 10 here. To keep this short, I'm going to look at two key characteristics. If you studied exponential functions, you know that substituting in 0 for x will give 1 for y, because any base to the power of 0 is 1. One of the properties of inverse functions is that the x's and the y's are switched. The domain for the original function becomes the range for the inverse, and the range for the original function becomes the domain of the inverse. So we can say that the logarithmic function passes through 1, 0, where the original function passed through 0, 1. I'll sketch both graphs simultaneously using red for the original function, 10 to the x, and green for the inverse function, log of x. Again, if you studied exponential functions, you know that the base exponential function is going to have a horizontal asymptote of y equals 0. Now because log of x is the inverse of 10 to the x, and the domain and range interchange, we can say that the inverse function will also have an asymptote, but this asymptote will be a vertical asymptote at x equals 0. To develop the sketch of both of these functions, we can use the idea that a function is just an input-output mechanism where I can sub in different x values get out different y values, and then plot them on a graph as an ordered pair, just like I did with 0, 1, and 1, 0. Since the domain of the original function is any real number, I can sub in any number, negative or positive, and produce this sketch. You can see my y values never become negative as a result of my horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. We can do the same thing with the logarithmic function, subbing in x values to develop this sketch. Remember, for my original function, I was not able to cross the x-axis as a result of my horizontal asymptote. 
but the same is true for my inverse function, log of x, except I'm not able to cross the y-axis because of the vertical asymptote at x equals zero. Remember, because the log function is the inverse of the exponential function, all of the points on the graph of log of x can be produced by reflecting the points on the original function over the line y equals x. 0, 1 becomes 1, 0. 1, 10 on the exponential becomes 10, 1 on the logarithm. This can be done for any number of points to develop this sketch. I hope you found this video brief yet comprehensive enough to be able to answer the question, what even is a logarithm? Oh, and always use a stepladder. This world needs more trees, not less. Hey. Hey.